So welcome everybody to the Martin Siegel Theater Center here at the uh, Graduate Center CUNY. It's uh, the third reading in one day. It's much more than we normally do, but um, um, uh, it is always a big decision what to do. Should we have you know one reading each week or two together? Or we want to have the players also come as a group. So um, we are very thankful for all of them uh, to come here and for you uh, to come here. Uh, the writer Kuro Tanino, uh, whose play um, uh, Avida, the Hot Spring Junkies in Hell Valley, uh, uh, he could not come and could not make it. He uh, is rehearsing in Tokyo. He was briefly considering to flying in for one day, and then his production manager most probably wisely said no. Um, and um, he uh, really had it on his mind. He's a great, I think, uh, Japanese theater maker, uh, writer, own director, that auteur de théâtre idea. They are all, of, so many of them, like Jean-Luc Godard in the film, they produce your work, write their work. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a fantastic um, theater scene, as we know. We, we hear it not enough, and we do not see all the voices that are out there. So. Um, this is part of an exchange. It's a, a, a Japanese playwright a, a project. It's the second one we do. Ten years ago, we did it. And uh, Toshiki Okada at that time came. It's the first time he came to the US. He was a very young writer. Now he became a very significant force in global theater. And um, so it has given us a lot. And uh, again, we have now uh, those four playwrights with five uh, presentations. And I think this is a most significant exchange. We need to hear voices from around the world. Theater is practiced uh, locally, in the room, with the people who are there. But we have to think globally. This is very significant, very important. We need to know what's going on. As musicians actually do know what their colleagues are playing uh, around the world. My name is Frank Henschke. I'm the director of the Siegel Center and um, uh, uh, director of programs. And uh, we bridge academia in professional theater, international, and American theater. And if you go to our website, you see all of our varieties of activities, whether it comes to publishing and books, journals, uh, hosting, visiting scholars from around the world. But this is really at the center uh, of our uh, uh, activities, to have artists come, expose them also to New York, take time, be here, but also have work them as professional New York actors and directors. And Tonight we have the great pleasure to have two artists back who have uh, worked with that a lot of three. There's of course Black Eyed Susan, Mallory Cutlet, the director who has been here for many times. Here she is, well, maybe we say hi, and this is Susan. And, um, and Rob, um, who was here for Prelude, many of them. So it's a fantastic uh, 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 lineup, and, um, and also welcome, of course, to you and uh, you and um, everybody who is involved uh, in it. So it's a big honor to have you here again. Thank you to the Japan Foundation. We have two representatives here. The Japan Foundation generously supports this project. And I know everybody says, oh, let's thank our sponsors and don't forget it on this and that. I really want to point out what great work the Japan Foundation does, how uh, closely they actually monitor what we do. Uh, we think a little bit too much, but they really, they really do. Um, and they make these things happen where they say, you know, that actually does make sense. This is of significance and really want to like to thank you for, for doing this. It would all not happen without you, as you really know. And we think it's a significant exchange uh, that uh, it starts very small. And we hope perhaps to create this as a festival uh, here in New York, as we did uh, the first time we did uh, the Japan Playwright Project. Um, so thank you all for coming. Now it's time to uh, take out the cell phones. Where is it here? And see if yours is off. I'll do the same. It's actually not off. Now it is, so it could be on silent. And after uh, the performance tonight, if you want to join us for a beer or a wine around the corner, it's a little bar called the Archive Bar on 36th Street. The address is printed in the program, so I hope you um, um, or come and Mallory, can we ask you to um, say maybe say a very few things about the play and the work and about uh, what we decide sure. about the play? You want to give a No, short? I think we should just get on with it. Let's get on with it. Okay, yeah. so let's start. Let's get on with it. Okay. It, I think it explains itself. Okay. okay. An old hot spring inn. A four-sided set sits on top of, of a revolving stage. Side one, entrance, hall, and bathroom. Side two, guest rooms. Side three, changing room for the bath. Side four, open air hot spring bath. A courtyard is at the center of the four sides 
and a persimmon tree grows there. Japan has many places called Hell Valley. This place's name is due to the hot springs born of abundant geothermal energy. The Hell Valley hot springs in this tale is located in the Horuriku region of Japan. In addition to the plentiful mineral water, this place is named after the hellish looking scenery carved out of the diorite rock of the volcano that erupted about 200 years ago. Now, the lights go on as the wall clock strikes the hour. It is two o'clock. About eight kilom kilometers deep into the mountains from the center of the hot spring area, there is a little known and unnamed hot spring inn. A father and son have come from Tokyo to do a job on the request of the inn's management. With autumn preparing rapidly for winter, it is a cold day and the temperature dips below zero degrees. They arrive in the afternoon, three minutes after two o'clock. Scene one, the front entrance. No one is manning the unadorned reception desk. Only a string of a thousand paper cranes hanging from the ceiling gives this space some ambiance. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. He exits the building. It is cold, so let us enter and take a rest. An elderly figure appears, a little breathless after having walked up the long mountain road. Excuse me. Let's go in. See the chair over there? Please. Ah, yes. No one seems to be around. Let's wait. There's a toilet here. What's this place called? There was no name on the letter we got. Ah, is that so? There's no signboard either. Old inns like this sometimes don't put any up. Uh-huh. He takes out a thermos from a wrapping cloth and offers his father some tea. I thank you. He opens a Tupperware container and offers the contents to his father. What's this? Dumplings smothered in sweet soy powder. In this cold, the human body needs sugar. But as if he had decided it was too early to consume any, his father continued to have only tea. No need to call anymore. Right. The letter. Have you checked it? I'll go over it again. <clears throat> An honorable request, dear sir, the season of autumn colors has arrived, wafting on the wind. Uh, Mr. Momofuku Kurata, master puppeteer, I hope this finds you enjoying days of good health. Please excuse me for making this sudden request, but I hope you will consider it favorably. <clears throat> and would it be possible for you to fulfill my long-held desire for a puppet performance by your esteemed self at my inn? <laughs> I take the presumption of enclosing a map with this letter. I humbly hope you will find this invitation agreeable and acceptable. Yours uh, sincerely on a propitious October day, 2013. Someone's coming. Oh, really? Most likely a guest. This is Takiko, a villager. Those who know her call her Otaku. Her village is located about four kilometers from this spa. Over 80 years of age, she still cannot quit smoking. Since her husband's death 10 years ago, her daily intake has increased. She has come to this spa since childhood and now stays every year for the period between autumn and the beginning of winter. The hot spring water serves to allay her chest pains. How do you do? I do, uh, oh. Uh, I, uh, I don't, I don't, what is this? Oh, how do you do? I am Karata. Oh. Mm. 
We were called from Tokyo this evening. We are scheduled to perform. Well, I... Is, is the owner of the inn away? Oh, um, what? Oh, um, the owner of the inn? Uh, a performance? That's right. We, we are looking for the inn owner. I don't know. Is that right? I see. No one's in charge here. Huh? No one in charge? Right. No one runs the inn. Where is the inn owner? Inn owner? Well, he's not here. There, there is no inn owner. No one liked that at all. Is that so? Are you a neighbor? Oh, what? Me? Oh, no. I, I don't live nearby. Do you come here often? Yeah, I do. Really? Are you, are you too sick? Huh? You have to treat your sickness. Is that right? We only came here to perform. The inn owner asked us to. Oh, I told you the inn owner isn't here. How many times do I have to tell you? You're lying. You two are here because you're sick. She says no one's in charge. Ah, uh, yes. I need to go. Say, who the heck are you people? Each, you know, brings out a cigarette from his pocket and lights it. He inhales deep, and then exhales the smoke slowly. Well, I do follow what you say. This isn't the kind of place for entertainment. We don't get travelers staying here, either. No one outside the village knows about this place. If you head farther west, towards Sana Shrine, there's a hot spring town that has inns and so on that offer entertainment. So maybe you mistook this place for one of those. I see. The sound of Momofuku urinating can be heard. Hey, wait, wait, wait a bit. Yes? Who the heck is that man? My father. Hey. He is my father. What? Your father? Your father? Yes. Oh, is that true? Uh huh. Your father? Yes. Oh, come on, not true. Momofuku emerges from the restroom. Otaki chants a Buddhist sutra. It seems she still cannot believe him. Momofuku puts on an extra pair of straw sandals provided by the inn and goes out. When Ichiro tries to follow him, he stops his son. You stay. I'm going to take a look around. Otaki continues her Buddhist chanting while Momofuku goes for a walk. Oh, ha. So what is it? What kind of what kind of performance do you do? Puppetry. Puppetry. Puppetry? Oh, I don't understand. What is that? Well, <clears throat> you see, to to put it simply, we manipulate a puppet and make a show. Uh, I don't really understand. I've never seen anything like that. I, you're. Your, your father's an old man. He's enjoying a long life. He must be over 80, right? Right. Oh, that's it. Same here. The poor man was brought all the way here. Yes, but this is how we make a living. The, the bus service has ended by now. Is that so? I'd better check again. Never mind, you can stay tonight. Use the room, uh, oh, down over there. Uh huh. If the buses have ended for the day, we'll have no choice but to stay. Oh, the buses have all gone. 
Oh, never mind, never mind. You'll meet a blind man called Matsuo in that room. People who come here are all sick. So we share a room with him, right? There are no other rooms, so it's, it's a squeeze. Your father, your father hasn't come back yet. Right. What are your names? Did I ask you before? I am Ichigo Kurata. Ichigo? What, what's your father's name? Momofuku, Momofuku Kurata. Momofuku? Well, that's an unusual name. What Japanese characters are, are used? The number 100 for Momo and happiness for Fuku. Wonderful. What a fascinating name. I'm, I'm to keep up. Thank you. After you've had a rest, please try the hot spring bath. If the buses are gone. Oh, take your luggage to your room. If you leave your bags out here, they'll get in the way. Well, we won't be able to smoke, you know? I see. You should get warmed up. Take it easy. Ichiro ducks under the beaded curtain and heads for the guest room. Otaki takes out a cigarette, but suddenly feeling a cold draft pass over her hot body, she decides not to smoke. Whether it was because of the two men's guileless appearance or because the cold was attracted to warm bodies, or because Ichiro's eyes gleamed like a nocturnal insect's. Takiko's thoughts wandered back to her deceased husband. At her age, this was extremely unusual. Otaki decides against mountain vegetable picking and goes back to her room. The inn's wooden structure also trembled at the visit of these two men. The heart of this barely known inn also seemed to be Shaken. Blackout. Greetings, everyone, and thank you for coming today to see Avidya, hot spring junkies in Hell Valley. Please enjoy the show. Lights up. Scene two, guest rooms. The two large guest rooms are on different floors. The room for men is on the first floor, and the one for women on the second. From upstairs, a large persimmon tree can be seen standing in the courtyard with leaves past the glory of autumn and uh, the ripe fruit ready to fall. Ichiro opens the sliding doors and enters the downstairs guest room. While he is setting down his luggage, Momofuku returns from his walk. Pointing at the Wheeler suitcase, he says, Let him stretch his arms and his legs. Yes, right away. Momofuku sits down by a window and gazes out at the scenery. Ichiro undoes the rope around the luggage. Then he stops working on the luggage, goes to the closet, and pulls out several cushions, dusts them off, and puts them on the floor by Momofuku. Please use these. Aren't you cold? Uh, hmm. Ichiro prepares her uh, prepares tea again and serves it to Momofuku with the sweet dumplings. Thanks. So, what about the return bus? I don't know yet. After this, I will go check. Good. Hey, remember that time the house we fled into? Where was it? Oh. Um, See, that was like this, too. I know what you mean. Let me see now. What was it called? Was it Oyama? No, I don't think so. Oh, Oizumi. Mm, no, not that. That's not it. Really? This is a pleasant place. Uh-huh. The mountains are attractive. I'll go and check the bus timetable. Please do. The sun begins to set and the temperature drops. From afar, a shot from a hunting rifle is heard. The changing room door opens and a man wearing glasses 
steps into the inner yard. This is Matsuo, from the same village as Takiko, about four kilometers away. Since he damaged his eyes in an accident and lost his job, he's been staying in this spa frequently. The only clinic in the tiny village was unable to cure him. In despair, he believes that this, that his eyesight has returned to the point that he can sense the outline of many things due to this health spa. For him, this is the last place of hope to regain his vision. Matsuo passes through the yard and enters the guest room. He has just left the bath and is carrying his towel over his shoulder. He sits down on the tatami floor and starts to read a book. Oh, excuse me. How do you do? I didn't realize you were here. Uh-huh. <laughs> Uh, my vision is very poor. Uh-huh. Are you a traveler? Hmm? Well, sort of. It's unusual to have travelers here. Where are you from? From Tokyo. Really? <laughs> you must be tired. Are you alone? My son is with me. Ah, you're with a boy. That is commend uh, commendable. Mm. Are you here about... Um, your body? What do you mean, my body? Well, there are hot springs further down. No one needs to come up this far. Are you ill? No. Oh, are you just passing by? That's about right. Really, is that so? I'm surprised you found this out of the way spot. Momofuku takes out a cigarette and smokes. He opens the window a tad. Your throat is precious, you know. Huh? My throat is all right. Ah, uh, but tobacco is bad for you. <laughs> True. And the air up here is very clean, too. You know, rest well, and you will recover in time. Momofuku stubs out his cigarette in the ashtray. Matsuo continues to read his book. <laughs> you must consider this comical. Uh, what is? <laughs> to see a blind man read a book? Before, I would read Braille, but then I thought, as I couldn't see, there was no pressing need to read books. Uh, uh, see, this, these are all pressed flowers. They say that if you become blind, your third eye will open up, but it's not that simple. Oh, really? Being in touch with life in this way, I feel I will have an opportunity to gain such wisdom. Hmm. A third eye, you say? I, I just mean that I'm hoping for it. What will you see with your third eye? With my third eye. So with a third eye, what will you see? That would be the soul. Oh, really? What will you do when you see the soul? Uh, nothing. I just want to see it. Oh, really? Please excuse me. I'm uh, Matsuo. What is your name? Karata. Mr. Karata. Thank you. Not at all, Mr. Matsuo. Would you like to touch? Huh? Matsuo cannot comprehend what Momofuku means and ponders over his words. He has tremors from the neck up. Ichiro returns. Matsuo suddenly moves into a defensive position and quickly looks around warily. Ichiro tells his father, that he could not find anyone managing the inn, and the day's bus service has already ended. Yes, I see. So we cannot return today. Exactly. The next bus leaves uh, at 6.30 a.m. Yes. That will be all right. I am sorry. Pass me the box. When Ichiro makes a sharp turn to reach the box, he notices Matsuo. Ah, excuse me. I am very sorry. Huh? I, uh... Yes. Ichiro hands Momofuku the wheelie, the wheeler case, the wheeler suitcase. Momofuku opens and checks the contents. Mr. Matsuo, I assume. We are from Tokyo. 
Yes, I know. Your father told me earlier. Is that right? I'm very surprised. Is something the matter? No, no. I, I have poor eyesight, so... Oh, I see. No matter, no matter. You, you misunderstand. I, I can pick up on people's presence, you see. So it wasn't a person just now, as you did it feel? No, no. Uh, that's not what I mean. As you referred to your son, I was imagining a little boy. Uh-huh. Intending to serve tea, Matsu searches for the tea canister and teacups. He cannot find the items easily. I don't need any tea, thank you. Uh, uh, really? We'll be sharing this room. We're the ones intruding into your space. We'll be leaving early tomorrow morning. Oh, that's unfortunate. And now that you're here, you might as well take your time. Uh-huh. Well, we'd like to do that, but in fact, we've been conned. What happened? We received a request from this inn to perform. Perform? Uh-huh. We perform puppet plays at dinner parties and such. So that's it. <laughs> I thought something was strange. Uh, even the sick don't usually come to a place like this. I, I see now. Uh-huh. I assume that you were here for your father's ailment. Please excuse me. Uh, a puppet show? That's unusual. And also strange. And as you can tell, this is a hot spring inn. Plain and simple, without parties and entertainment. Who contacted you? An invitation arrived, but without the sender's name, so here it is. Ichiro offers the letter. <coughs> uh, you know. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Never mind. Uh, uh, but it is strange. We don't have an inn owner here. Huh. We heard from the lady. Ah, you mean Otaki, Takiko, the granny. At the reception by the entrance. Of course. That was where the inn owner sat long ago. At that time, the surrounding villages were large, and this place was apparently quite a popular spot. Um, Depopulation and the owner's decease. It's become open to the public, and visitors are careful of how they use the premises. The so-called visitors are basically only the regulars. I see. It's not the kind of spot that would be reviewed in some tourist book. Uh huh. So, ah, Sansuke might know something. Sansuke? Right. He's the bath attendant. That's so unusual nowadays, just him. But he's not employed by the inn. Uh, I don't know the details, but he's the longest resident here after Otaki. Is that so? I can ask him later. Yes, please. Are you in a hurry? No, no. Is there something else on your mind? Let me see. Where's the kitchen? Kitchen? Of course, of course. <laughs> that is a problem. <laughs> There's no kitchen. As we're only staying overnight, you probably won't need to use a kitchen, but I just wanted to check. Let's see. Uh, I'm about the only person who stays for long periods of time. I hardly eat at all. Uh huh. And every few days, I, I go to the mountains for some greens and I boil them in the hot spring. Just that makes a tasty meal. Really? Spa-boiled mountain greens. <laughs> Sansuke and I are the only ones who've lived here long. On rainy days, when the grounds get slippery, he'll gather some for both of us. That sounds like a tough life. I don't think I could bear it. Well, in the city, you could get whatever you want to eat, right? Oh, yes. Yeah, for sure. I'd like to go if I had the cash. Uh-huh. Have you been in Tokyo all your life? Were you born there? Huh. Really? <clears throat> the door of the changing room opens, and Sansuke appears. Ah, that must be Sansuke. The one wearing loose white leggings? <laughs> Please wait while I talk with him. Uh, could you lend me that letter? Oh, oh thanks. <laughs> Please, see if he knows anything. I'll see what he says. The Japanese characters for Sansuke are three and help lined up together. The word refers to a bath attendant who manages the bathing water supply, supervises customers, and also provides body washing and hair combing services. A very old vocation. These attendants were paid well in the Edo period. Nowadays, however, few public bathhouses hire them. This Sansuke is a silent and hard worker. 
As nobody has ever heard his voice or his name, we just call him Sansuke. Matsuo returns to the room. He doesn't seem to know anything. Uh, uh, thank you for this. Thank you very much. Uh, this is Sansuke. I am Kurata. My father and I will be staying overnight. Thank you for your services. Sansuke looks at the sleeping Momofuku and prepares the bedding. Please, do not bother. Sansuke disregards Ichiro and continues working. Upstairs, Otaki gets up. Moving to the window, she sits and ruminates over the father-son pair below. Thank you for talking with him. It's a great help to us. I'm sorry I couldn't find anything out. Oh no, not at all. Thank you very much anyway. He's the silent type. Very silent. He's probably dumb. <laughs> oh no. Don't say that. Sasuke picks up Momofuku and carefully lays him down on the futon. Oh, I, I, I will do that. Sasuke does not stop working. Is something bothering you? No. No. Has your father fallen asleep? Ah, yes, he is asleep. Sasuke puts Momofuku to bed and then moves into preparing Ichiro's futon. I will do my own. Sansuke stops working and exits. Did he do something weird? No. You can open the window if you like. Oh, I, I'm not hot. Are you feeling cold? No, neither. Ichiro takes cigarettes and a lighter out of his pocket and places them on top of his folded jacket. If you want to smoke, don't worry about me. There's an ashtray um, somewhere here. Thank you. If you are looking for a cushion, I need to go. Oh, there's a toilet beyond the reception at the end of the hall to the left. Thanks. Matsuo approaches the soundly sleeping figure and touches Momofuku through the bedding. He finds that this man's body is abnormally small. Matsuo startles at the sound of women's voices coming from the changing room. He knocks over a teacup. He is deeply upset. The two women come out from the changing room, glowing pink from the heat of the spa. Eight kilometers east of this inn lies a rustic hot spring town. These two women, Funye and Iku, are geisha. The two climb the stairs, open the sliding doors, and enter the upstairs room. Wow, surprise, surprise. Huh, oh, Otaki. You didn't go mountain veggie gathering after all? No, I didn't. Really? Downstairs, Matsuo begins to rifle through Momofuku and Ichiro's belongings. Fool me, fool me, fool me, hey. Huh? Did you see the strange father-son pair downstairs? Father-son? No. Are they guests? How unusual. At a place like this. Well, they are parent child, but close to our age. I hear they came from Tokyo. Wow, from Tokyo? Tokyo? They came here to perform, to to do a, a puppet show. A puppet show? Oh my, at which hotel? Ik, did you hear about it? No way. The which is here. Huh? Here? Yeah, that's what they said. Oh, I was dumbfounded. <laughs> <laughs> you are kidding us. How about some tea? You sure are kidding. Oh, you do think I've gone senile. I'm saying the truth. But this place isn't for dinner parties. How about your tea? Oh, thank you. That's good. Then go downstairs and ask them. Really? You're kidding. Someone hired them. What? Who would do that? Yeah, they had an invitation letter. Huh? Yeah, and a map. Of what? Of this place? Yeah. 
It's a prank. Oh, that's true. That sounds spooky. You know, I know. It's Atsuka's doing. No way. How could he? He can't even talk. You're right. He can't write either. I agree. It's a mistake. A mistake. Some kind of a misunderstanding. Tonight, another aim is shot by two performers. Like the shamisen, the dad is about that much. What is? His height. Uh -huh. Oh yeah? He's short? Yeah. Well, so, you know, there are people like that. What? No, there aren't. I've never seen one before. Must be. Some are born like that. The sound of Ichio pulling on the toilet roll can be heard. Matsuo stills his hand for a moment, but then continues rummaging through the luggage. He finds Ichiro's down jacket and tries it on. Now, the sum is what? There's more? Is also short. Nah, he's normal height. He's normal, but when you look at him, you'll feel butterflies in your stomach. Hmm. What? What do I mean by butterflies? No, never mind. Never mind, never mind. What's got into you? Never mind, it's bedtime. Bedtime. What was that about? Having butterflies? A toilet flushing is heard. Matsuo feels something in a wrapping cloth. Hmm. Diapers? Well, that's enough, Otaki. Iku and me, I have to practice. Will the people below mind? No, they won't. How should I know? Go ask them. Never mind. This is that kind of place. Bravo, Sess. Oh, don't blame me. We won't. Okay, Iku, here we go. Ready? Age-wise, Fumie and Iku are like mother and daughter. Fumie, who is childless, treats Iku like a dear daughter, and Iku involuntarily recalls her own mother when she looks at Fumie, short, knobbly fingers. Otaki watches the two women quietly from her bed. It was the usual kind of evening, but tonight seemed different. Thinking so, Otaki felt butterflies again. All right, let's go over what we did last night. Yes. Downstairs, Ichiro returns to the guest room. Matsu hurriedly gets to the table. Uh, would, uh, would you like some tea? Uh -huh. No thanks. Ichiro sits by the window and looks outside. Taking out a cigarette, he begins to smoke. When he opens the window a tad, the music becomes audible. It sounds good. It certainly does. They are geisha. Oh, really? They come here often. They live in a dormitory in the hot spring town, but come here so they can practice whenever they want. Indeed. They are stupendous drinkers. They can drink any man under the table. Really? They are also cheerful and kind. Just like family. Oh, family? <laughs> I, I, I guess so. But during the winter, what with the heavy snow, we can't use this place. We all go different ways. When it warms up and the snow decreases, we meet here again. But each reunion is a totally new meeting of strangers as if nothing has happened here before. <laughs> and that too melts away. Um, <laughs> uh -huh. Like the snow, as you said. Uh huh. Is your father always. Uh huh. With you? Uh huh. That's good enough for today. Thank you very much. Oh, the talking is falling asleep. Oh my. Ah, the mountaintops are
covered with snow. It really is winter. Is it? Seems a little early, do you know? Let me see. Oh, I can't recall any of them. Really, I can't remember their darn names. You mean that one? That's Mount Hoten. You don't need to know. But how many years have I been here already? Don't count. Here, tea. Ah, oh, thanks. Do you see that white temporary building? Construction is about to begin. Next summer, a railway will be laid down here. Is that oh. really going to happen? I heard about it. Hey, is, is that true? Big sis, I didn't know you were awake. Is it true? One of my customers has an important position in a construction company, and he told me. The new bullet, new bullet train will pass through this area, though the hot spring town farther down won't be affected. Is that real? What about here? What's going to happen to this place? I don't know the details. It might vanish. It's hard to tell. But if the, demoli uh, the demolition team comes here, this building will be the first to go. Without the owner, that's inevitable. Oh, that is so sad. Yeah. I wanted to die here. Now, don't get like that. Oh. <sighs> this place has been so convenient. Having a soak, practicing, performing at parties, getting drunk, staying here whenever we please. No fear of bumping into customers. Right you are. What a shame. Just another year would help. Why? Why another year? It's going to be winter very soon. Without this place, Sasuke will leave. Iku will return 39 next year, you know? Oh, so that's what it's about. It's tremendously important. Iku, uh, what does your husband do? Oh, Kozo is on a business trip to Hokkaido. But he'll return soon. He's got my back. For his sake, too. I want to have a baby before I turn 40. Oh, you got to work at it. Right. You do fine. No problem. Oh. But it would be lonely here. May I have one? Um, cigarette? Is that okay? Of course. Um, uh, could you light it for me, too? Are you all <coughs> 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 Look over here. Are you all right? Uh -huh. um, so ripe and good to eat, huh? Oh, the... Oh. Oh, the, the, the persimmons? Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder why the sunset seems so red. Now I know the fruit is ready to be harvested. You think so? They look a tad on the brown side. When they ripen that much, they are spoiled. A touch of brown brings out their best. Oh, then try some. I will later. Don't fuss. Come on, Ick. Get ready. Our contact will arrive soon to pick us up. Are you two going already? Today's an early performance. Iku? I'm coming. Right away. Are, are you both busy? Not at all. This time, today is unusual. I wonder if there will be more work when the bullet train comes through. When? The new railroad with it will lose your jobs to the young women moving in. Otaki. What? Don't talk like that. I'll take a map and then another soak in the spa. Oh, what a shame. No man da, no man da, no man da. Make sure you really sleep. Fumie and Iku start on their professional makeup. 
in front of the vanity mirrors. Uh, let me show you the bath. Uh -huh. Are you sure you don't need to wake up your father? No, not at all. You see, I want to see your bodies. Do you think it's strange of me to say that? Well, wh why do you? Well, not many men come around here. They're unusual. Is that so? This is a very unusual opportunity, and, and what's more... Yes? I said I was startled at your appearance because I thought you'd be a little boy. Maybe, maybe that wasn't the only reason. Well, my bod's hardly for display, you know. Please, <laughs> go ahead, I'll, I'll have another smoke. I'll wait for you. Your father's sleeping well. Oh, Otaki, do you want me to bring something back for you? Or how about some leafy pickles? <laughs> no problem. Momofuku wakes up and leaves the room. Matsuo is so excited he doesn't notice that Momofuku has left. The stage revolves quietly. The setting sun casts shifting shadows on the six characters' faces. Scene three. The changing room at the back. Sunset. The rays of the setting sun enter through the ventilation duct. The electric fan on the wall is on but rattles from old age, humidity, and overuse. The sound of hot spring water flowing into the bathtub in the bathing area can be heard. Sansuke is cleaning the changing room with zest. He is going after each spot that needs attention. The door of the changing room opens and Momofuku enters. Sansuke stiffens and stands at attention. Oh, so you were Sansuke. How curious. Sansuke nods eagerly like a mouse devouring its prey. As Momofuku undresses, Sansuke is absolutely thrilled and almost paralyzed with joy. <laughs> Here. He throws small change into the small bamboo basket on the floor. Sansuke bows deeply. I'll have a soap first. Momofuku opens the sliding door to the bathing area and disappears into the clouds of steam. Sounds are heard of, Mom of Momofuku pouring hot spring water over himself followed by lighter, snappier sounds of the wood basin being handled. Sansuke presses himself against the glass door and peers in at Momofuku in the bathing area. Liquid oozes from Sansuke's nose. He wipes it away with his finger. A nosebleed. He tries sniffing many times, but the bleeding won't stop. He shoves some tissue paper hard up his nose. A distant temple bell rings faintly. Sansuke looks at his gold wristwatch. It is just about 5 p.m. Sansuke feels something happening between his legs. His penis is erect and throbbing vigorously. He is astonished by this reaction and tries to repress it by blowing on or hitting himself. The changing room door opens and Ichiro and Matsuo enter. Uh, you can undress here. Thank you. You probably don't have a hand towel. Uh, Sansuke can provide you with one. Ichiro begins to undress. Matsuo watches him spellbound. Ichiro places banknotes in the bamboo sieve. Sansuke's eyes open wide in surprise. I'll go ahead. Oh, sure. Matsuo removes his clothes hurriedly. Sansuke stops Matsuo, who is about to enter the bathing area, and removes his eyeglasses for him. I'm shaking. Let me rest a bit. What is it that the blind Matsuo wants to see? What can there be for him? Thanks. Now I'm ready. Now, let us enter the bathing area. The stage set revolves. Scene four, the bathing area. From evening into night, an open rock bath comes into view. 
The sound of the continual waves of bubbling hot water makes one sense the submerged power of the mountains, the formidable pulsation of nature. Momofuku and Ichiro are already soaking in the rock bath. I'm feeling all right now. Passing his hand over the stony surface of the tub, Matsuo walks along the bath. With practiced motions, he pours hot spray water over himself twice and then enters the bathtub. He does not allow his attention to waver from Ichiro, who is on the other side of the misty steam. Mo Momofuku rises from the tub. Hey, oh, Mr. Kurata, you were here after all. Sansuke comes running from the changing room to the bathing area. He washes Momofuku delicately and then massages his, his shoulders, after which he combs Momofuku's hair. Good job. Thanks. Your turn now. Thanks. My turn, please. Sansuke gives Ichiro a wash, moving on to massaging his back. His thick biceps begin to quiver. The blind do look younger than others, don't you think? Uh, I can't tell. Touch yourself, and you'll see. Use those fingertips you pride yourself on. Go on, go on. You're an interesting character. Are your fingers only for pressing flowers? Uh, how about you, Mr. Karada? What's it like? What is? How is your body? It's hideous. Do you want to touch it? Uh oh. Nomofuku tenderly strokes Matsuo's cheek. I didn't mean to be rude. That's too bad. What about your son, Ichiro? He's in a worse state. Is that so? I don't understand. Well, there's no need to be so tense. Sansuke finishes watching washing Ichiro and goes back to the changing room. Ichiro returns to the bathtub. Matsuo stiffens his body and tries to sense where Ichiro is. Silence continues for a while. Only the sound of the flowing spring water is heard. Momofuku puts his head against the edge of the bathtub and falls asleep. The faint sound of his breathing reaches Matsuo's ears. He must be tired. Has he fallen asleep? <laughs> I talk too much. But not to worry. The spring water's here, Armello. Uh-huh. I can feel that. I'm just a blind man, you know. But your father is eccentric. I can tell from what he says that that makes him very interesting. Uh... I see. Excuse me. Not at all. I'd like to see your puppet show. Well, it is unlikely that we will perform. Yeah, of course. I wouldn't be able to see it anyway. Um, what kind of puppet is it? What kind? Um, the shape. What does it represent? My father made it, so... Is it like a ventriloquist show? Oh, no. Really? If it's okay by you, could I touch the puppet later? No, you can't. Why not? No one can touch it. Not even me. I see. Excuse me for asking. At this moment, Matsuo felt that Ichiro's heart was at the bottom of eternal night. He felt darkness swell and ripple like a full, fully fed snake's belly and come after him. Where was the darkness rising from? How profound was it? For the first time since he became blind, Matsuo experienced an overwhelming desire. He wanted to see with his own eyes. To see. To see. Ishiro? Mr. Matsuo? What? Oh, yes. What are you searching for? The soul? It doesn't exist. Not anywhere. Not in me, nor in you. Oh, it's hot. As if escaping, Matsuo crawls out of the bathtub but quickly collapses on the floor. His lean, emaciated body heaves with irregular breathing. 
The thin glass shakes hard as the back doors open. Otaki enters the bathing area. Oh, excuse me. Oh, bye. What are you doing here? Are you all right? Excuse me. Oh, uh, well. Ooh, that's a strange one. Otaki pours hot spring water over herself twice and steps into the rock tub. Oh, the spring water feels weird today. Eh. Otaki the standard wash. Ow! 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 Too, too strong. What are you doing to me? I gave you plenty of money. Now do your job. Oh, that's it. That's it. That's right. You know, the girls will be, will be back early tonight from their party duty. Take care of Iku tonight, okay? Oh, hey, hey, look, did you hear me? She grabs his crotch. Well, that's enough. Finish up. Finish up. You don't need to do my hair. Sounds good goes back to the changing room, and Otaki steps into the bath. Oh, that was good. Thank God. Excuse me. Oh, go ahead. Momofuku goes to the changing room. Ichiro also readies to leave. Isn't your father tired? Oh, well, maybe. The spring water is mellow here. Yes, it is. You can't get this in Tokyo, right? You're right. Aren't you glad you stayed? Yes, to be sure. I knew that. What about your mother? Is she, is she about my age? She's gone. Really? Did she pass away? Uh-huh. Right after she gave birth to me. Right after your birth? Well, what a shame. Uh, are you married? No. Not even one? No. No, no lovers? None. Ah, oh, that's terrible. In junior high, you must have had a sweetheart. Do you remember? I didn't go to school. What? You didn't, you didn't go to junior high? No. How, how about elementary school? No. What were you doing? I helped my father. With the puppets? Uh-huh. All the time? Yes. But why did you? That was my father's decision. Excuse me. Got to go. <laughs> the sun has set completely. The stage revolves. Scene five in the guest rooms. Nighttime. It is a little after six o'clock in the evening, but it is already completely dark outside. The shaded incandescent light above the changing room door lights up the immediate area. After his bath, Momofuku is in the yard looking at the persimmon tree. Matsuo is in the downstairs guest room. Momofuku returns to the room. Darn, it's dark in here. Momofuku gets up on the table, pulls the dangling pole string, and lights up the room. Ah, you were here after all. I'm going for a walk. Oh? Isn't it dangerous at night? I'll take care. You'll take care. Isn't it better to stay inside? Matsuo exits. Momofuku sits by a window and smokes. Excuse me, I got held up. Anything to eat? Only rice balls. I'm sorry. And some tea, too. Certainly. It's strange, isn't it? 
Uh-huh. Are we such a curiosity? Not really. They just want to think so. <laughs> well, I look utterly miserable. If that's what you want to think, Father. Mm, I do. The sound of the front door of the inn being opened roughly. Fouye and Iku have returned from work. Both are drunk. They are bad-mouthing their customers and boasting of how they escaped from having to help out in the kitchen. Hear that? The wild beasts have arrived to grace our table. They can be both quiet and active, you know. Uh-huh. They know how to prey on you. Afraid? Aren't you afraid? They've come to devour you. Women are terrified. Shh. Here they come. Oh, uh, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. No kidding. <coughs> Your father and son. Shh. Yikes. He moved. He moved. He really moved. That's thin. Is it the puppet? No way. That's the man who handles the puppet. A puppet man? What do you mean by puppet man? He looks like a puppet, right? I'm totally confused. Why? <laughs> you mean there's a puppet that moves the puppet? <laughs> Stop it. They can hear us. <laughs> close the door. Just close it. Let's be proper. I agree. I totally understand. They open the door again. Good evening, I'm Kumie, and I'm Iku. We are geisha at the hot spring town. They show the men the shamisens strapped on their backs. Bing, bing. <laughs> Good evening. We are from Tokyo and have arranged to stay overnight. The name's Kurata. That's quite all right. Mr. Kurata, please have an enjoyable stay. Oh, Ma'am, don't act as if you own this place, sis. <laughs> uh, we've finished for the day. Completely finished. Mr. Karata, would you like some sake? I snitched it from the dinner party. Uh-huh, but girl, you said it would be all right, sis. Let's have a drink. That's the spirit. Drink, drink. Oh, Otaki. It's Otaki for crying out loud. Oh, I uh -huh, you girls back already? That's right. Wanna join us? Oh, I pass. Too bad. What a loss. Let the green cheese go and let's have some fun. Oh, stop fucking me. Otaki starts going upstairs. Piss off, ya yeah, bitch. Upstairs. She hangs up her towel and sits by a window to cool down. With an ashtray in one hand, she smokes. When she opens the window, the sound of boisterous voices rises up. Shut the fuck up, you dumbasses. Downstairs, Fumie and Iku are serving sake. They pour it generously into the teacups. Would the master care for sake, a son? No, no, thank you. My father doesn't drink. Ah, what a shame. This is for you. Welcome to our part of the world. I'll take just one. Oh, great sake. Ready? Here's another. Tokyo is my dream. It's an ideal place. I don't want to go there. You are a citizen from an ideal city with stone paved roads and rows of red brick buildings. Yay! Yay! Everyone eats outside. Outside? You didn't know? They take their table and chairs outside. And they drink wine. They don't drink, uh, they don't eat rice. No cool, you know. They eat potatoes. Potatoes, mush potatoes, see? Yeah, and drink delicious wine. Not this smelly old sake. Oh, shoot, I almost forgot. Fumie brings out pickles. Did you get that for Otaki? Who cares? She won't want it anyway. Here you go. No thanks. 
Oh, come on, don't hold back. Very tasty. I want some too. And here. Ah. Uh, I hear you guys do puppetry. Uh huh. Wow. What kind? Like traditional jewelry puppetry, or like the road puppets in that TV show, Romance of Three Kingdoms. Oh, I know. That's it. Uh, what's it called? The kind with uh, uh, strings? What kind do you use? No, it's not like that. Well then, what is it like? Well, let me see. Oh, I'd love to see your show. Wanna see, wanna see, wanna see. But not today. Please, oh please, big bro. Fumie slides across the tatami floor to where Ichiro is. She pushes her firm breasts against his arm. Oh, no, that's not... We beg you, please. Even so, it's not possible. In that case, we'll go first, and you go next, okay? We go first, you're next. Oh, righty. What's the music? Whatever you like, sis. It's fine with me. Oh, anything goes home. We're so drunk. Everything will sound the same. Let's see. What would... Oh, now. What about this? Or something else? Echigo Lion? That's depressing. Let's do something brighter. How dare 
Why do you play so loud? I know. You can't use this place as you like. I know that. What are you so grumpy about? Will we just cut it out, will you? I'm done. It's over. It's over. You behave yourselves in front of the guests. My kimono just got a big mess up. Utaki, the Karasa father and son's puppet performance is about to start now. What's that? Time for entertainment. Quality entertainment. No, these guests are tired and they need their sleep. Stay and watch and talky. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Get up now and go upstairs. Hey, uh, we'll do a short piece. Yes, sir? What, really? Hey, you guys are the best. Woohoo, fantastic. There you go. Suddenly, Sansuke charges into the room. Oh, Sansuke? Sansuke puts away the teacups and pot and turns the top board over to the mahjong side. He wipes down the board with his hand towel and goes rushing out again. Sansuke, huh?
you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the Jonathan performance. Oh, oh, not at all. Momo Fuku, continuing to talk gently to the puppet, puts him back in the suitcase. You did very well today. Tomorrow we'll start early. Let's get some shut out. We have to take the early bird bus back to Tokyo. Momo Fuku gets into the futon and falls asleep. Sansuke is standing in the courtyard. A thin layer of snow is forming on his head and shoulders. I think I'm wasted. <laughs> uh -huh. Me too. Let's go back up. Yeah. Good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you very much. Otaki leaves the room. At the top of the stairs, she turns off the light and the two women that the, that the two women had left on. Good night. Otaki gets into her futon. Lying on her back, she raises one arm and moves her fingers. She isn't trying to mimic the puppetry, but to confirm that she is alive. She wants to touch life itself. Iku stretches her hand from the futon, finds her smartphone on the low table, and phones her husband, who is on a business trip, and there is no reply. She emails instead. Fumie is wrapped up in her futon and does not move. Sasuke is still standing outside. He is sobbing loudly and large tears are running down his face. Ichiro opens the window. The show's over. It's all right now. You'll catch cold out there. Sansuke is immobile. Excuse me. Sansuke? Look. Sansuke, it's over. He's gone back inside. The Sansuke remains in the yard. His tears continue to flow. Sansuke, you know he's gone. Uh, that's not... Mr. Matsuo, let it go. I'm going to bed. Uh, uh -huh. I see your point. May I turn off the light? Oh, please don't worry about me. Go ahead, you can turn it off. Thank you. It doesn't matter to me either way. Ishiro turns off the electric light. Matsuo also tries to turn it off, but has difficulty finding the pull string. Ichiro grabs Matsuo's arm. Ah! Ichiro makes Matsuo grasp the pull string. I never turn the light on, so I'm not used to finding the cord. The whole inn is now in darkness. Only the small, incandescent light by the changing room shines on large snowflakes of snow. Sansuke bows deeply and returns to the changing room. Matsuo, still standing, takes off his dark glasses with trembling hands. Revealed are two holes where his eyeballs should be. No one uses it anymore. But a very long time ago, uh -huh. this place was called Avidya Inn. Really? Uh, Abhidha means ignorance and is one of the 12 Nidanas in Buddhism. Are you familiar with them? Uh-uh. The 12 Nidanas are the 12 linked doctrines which describe causes of human pain. The first one is ignorance, which means not knowing. Indeed. It begins with ignorance, then constructing activities, consciousness, Name and form, sixfold senses, contact, feeling, love, clinging, becoming, birth, aging, and death. 
They are considered the primary causal relationships between the connected links. You know, humans are naturally in anguish of mostly everything, and that is what we call life. Understanding these doctrines and their relationship truly would lead to spiritual awakening in Buddhahood. Is that right? It is intriguing that in Buddhism, love is considered a cause of suffering. Uh-huh. Please excuse me. The blind are bad blabbermouths. <laughs> Mr. Karada? Yes? Do you have any anxieties? Uh, well, don't we all? Do you have someone to love? Mr. Matsuha. If I may ask. That's enough. Sounds of soundscape cleaning the bath and changing room. Iku shuts off her smartphone, gets out her futon, and leaves the room on tiptoe. But when Iku's warm body passes through the icy cold wooden inn, the wooden inn creaks loudly. She silently begs, quiet as she descends the stairs. Iku reaches the courtyard. She spreads a hand towel over her hair to keep it from getting wet from the snow. She knocks on the changing room door, but there is no answer. It is cold. She knocks again, but Samsuke doesn't hear. Looking down, she spots a ripe persimmon fallen on the snowy ground. She picks it up, blows on it, and brushes the snow off. The surface snow melts, and the fully ripe orange persimmon glows in the palm of her hand. The changing room door opens slowly, and Sansuke's face appears. Sansuke, can you give me a wash? For me? Are you awake? Mm. I can't sleep. <laughs> me neither. That puppet show, it scared me. I kept my face down because it was too much for me. You know what I mean? Uh -huh. Yeah, that puppet was creepy. <laughs> really weird city people. <laughs> I didn't understand them, but that dad was working his Oh, that was his son, his eternal baby who never grows up. What are you talking about? I, I, I don't get it. Remember, I couldn't have a baby. What? Well, what happened? Remember? And so? No, so you see, I don't know. I feel something, something will slip away. Oh, gotta get more sleep. I get the fluttering, don't you? Shut it, you are different from them. No, no, that's not the point. Oh, so weird. I just went blank. She was staring, huh? Iku was staring hard. Iku, I hope it goes well this time. Sansuke, go for it. For me. This time, you are bound to succeed. For me too. What is it? Never mind. What the mother, Otaki? Uh, I'm going for a smoke. Why don't you quit? It'll kill you, you know. Your shamisen playing has improved. The sound was attractive. Eco has got so much better too. It, it, it's sad that we might not be able to enjoy your performance from next year. Oh, shit. Cut it out. Fumiya gets up and pursues Otaki. Eco's panting can be heard from the changing room downstairs in the men's guest room. You sure? Ichiro doesn't answer. Matsuo assumes that Ichiro has fallen asleep and searches for the Wheeler suitcase. Practically crawling around the room quietly in the darkness, he eventually finds it. Ichiro is alert and watches Matsuo's every move. 
Maxwell opens the suitcase and raises up the puppet. Face, hands, body, legs, all the body parts of the puppet Matsuo touches are abnormal. Matsuo freezes up. Yeah. The mechanism of the puppet's mouth is released and its huge tongue flaps out. It hits Matsuo right in the face. Ah! He runs out of the room, cuts across the yard, and opens the changing room door. What? Mr. Matsuo, what's going on? Why do you close the door, stupid? Ichiro and Momofuku are left in the, in the guest room. Ichiro sits by a window and lights a cigarette. By opening the window a crack, he can hear many voices and sounds from the changing room. Come Iko's moans from the entrance, Fumio's weeping. From the bathing room, Matsuo's voice, fraught with anguish and pain. These sounds intermix and shake the small hot spring in, or maybe the inn itself trembles. Ichiro puts out his cigarette, closes the window, and leaves the room. In the yard, he looks up at the sky. The snowfall is getting worse. He enters the changing room. The stage leisurely begins and continues to revolve. Satsuke and Iku are in an embrace in the changing room. Iku is on top of him and kissing his neck. She is in ecstasy and doesn't notice Ichigo. He watches for a while, then moves to the bathing area where all the candles are lit. Matsuo has his mouth directly on the tap from which the hot spring water flows and drinks the hot water desperately. Ichiro watches for a while, then moves out of the bathing area. In the entrance hall, Otaki is smoking. Next to her, Fumie is standing and crying. Ichiro watches for a while, then moves back to his room. Momofuku is asleep with the puppet in his arms. Ichiro sits nearby. The stage continues to rotate. In the changing room, Iku is astride Sansuke. Eventually, with a great convulsion, they are both consummated. In the bathing area, Matsuo is still frantically swallowing the spring water. His stomach looks swollen. A pregnant woman from all the spring water he has drunk. In the entrance hall, Fumie is crying with her face against Otaki's chest. The stage continues to a stop with a cigarette dangling from her mouth, with a cigarette dangling from his mouth. Ichiro enters the entrance hall and hurries to the restroom. changing room and the bathing area can be seen simultaneously by the audience. Scene six, the changing room and the bathing area. Early morning, at six o'clock, silvery white rays of sunlight penetrate the changing room and the bathing area. 
On a day like this, the cries of the wild birds that have just awakened in the woods and the sounds of the bathing area blend beautifully. Sansuke and Ikaru are sleeping, cuddled up together in the changing room. Soon, they wake up. Iku goes for a soak, and Sansuke returns to his usual work. Yikes, it's chilly. Oh, Mr. Matsuo, good morning. Um, have you been here all the time? What's happened? Are you all right? Good morning. You, sis. Good morning. Good morning. You fell asleep right away last night, right? Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, morning. Morning. Good morning. As usual, old Taki carefully pours hot spring water over himself twice and gets in the rock bath. Uh, the three women are now soaking in the tub in the morning light. Iku is doing air, shall we say. Big sis, how does the rest go? Big sis, huh? what's up? Come on, you were just totally spaced out. Sorry, what is it? So, I'd like you to show me how to play the song after this part. Oh, that goes like this. Oops, was it a pick or a down pick? I can't remember. All right. It's gotta be down pick, huh? It's down pick. Really? Big sister Otaki, you are the one. Anyone would know how to play that song. Then could you help it, it with the rest of it? What? Hey, Otaki, this is the bit I don't get. Well, like this, this. No, no, this way. A ding dong shang. Jin dong shang. Jin dong shang. Jin dong shang. I can't, okay. Jin dong shang. Now, now, now. Now, now, now. Now, now, now. Good morning. Momofuku and Ichiro come into the bathing area in street clothes and with their luggage. Momofuku is holding the puppet. Here we are. Good morning, everyone. Now, now, now. Do the cleansing ritual. Ichiro takes a basin, scoops up some hot spring water, and pours it over the puppet. Now, now, now. Now. Yes, very good. Now let's take a bath. Momofuku picks up the puppet lovingly in his arms and gently, carefully washes him. Is it too hot? Are you okay? <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Tomatsuo alone, the overnight ordeal is not over. Matsuo throws up. A hefty amount of vomit splashes onto the bathroom floor. He repeats this vomiting many times. The spring water he drank last night to purify himself has burst out. After this happening, Matsuo left the inn for good. Blackout. Momofuku and Ichiro depart for the next performance venue. 
As the whole nation has gone insane and is craving for blood, Momofuku's dwarfish figure and puppetry were in much demand. People want to see misery, overwhelming misery. Time at this inn was different from ordinary time. On the way down the hill, Momofuku and Ichiro exchanged glances and smiled. This was not because they recalled the gold wristwatch and the generous payment. It was simply a familiar smile between father and son. Several days later, as if dropping through a crack in the sky, the hard winter season set in. Every year, snow becomes 2 to 2.5 meters deep in this district of villages. Few visitors come and the villagers stay indoors. Due to a shortage of workers, the hot spring inns all close down. This inn is no exception. The hot spring water alone continues to gush out and wait for the snow to thaw. This year in particular, the hot spring sounded sad, as if shivering. It seems afraid of the roar of heavy machinery arriving to lay the rails for the new bullet train. Ten months pass, and summer comes around again. The trees are spreading their fleshy leaves and displaying the fecundity of nature. Below them, cicadas are competing for their lives. So what has happened to the little known and unnamed hot spring inn in Hell Valley? <laughs> Lights up. Scene seven, the women's guest room. Summertime, daytime, in the courtyard. In the courtyard, the persimmon tree is spreading wide its deep green leaves. A baby is crying. Upstairs, Iku awakes and cuddles her baby. She brings out one of her breasts and nurses. We are looking forward to your visiting us again. Thank you. 
We can pass it around. Yeah. Hi everyone, congratulations, thank you. We are Wow, there is a strange state this uh, play gets, gets you in um, and your performance of it and interpretation. I was wondering, I always wanted to do this. Um, is there something that any of you would like me to ask? Because um, often there's, yeah, I always thought, maybe you have a question that you'd like to ask, you'd like to be asked, that you could answer. You know, I thought maybe I'd, I'd open with a chance to do that in relation to the work. <laughs> um, so, it's, so a question I would like you to ask me that yes. I have an answer to. Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Um, do you have one? Weirdly. Yeah. I mean, okay. when I read it, I had an impression, but did anybody get the impression that um, the inn was haunted and that none of us were real? Yeah. Wait, is that my question? Should I ask you that? Yeah, sure. <laughs> did any of you have the impression that the inn was haunted and uh, none of you were real? I'm really happy that you asked that question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, can you check the mic since we're recording? Oh, yeah, sorry. Oh, sorry, the recording, yes. Um, yeah, I had that impression the first time I read through the play. It just ended and I was like, it was very, it just got very surreal and it reminded me of some kind of um, like horror movies I've seen before and um, ending with a birth and a death in the water and all of that stuff. It was very, I was like, this is probably just an empty spa in the middle of nowhere that like these spirits kind of flow in and out of on a loop. Very nice, very nice job. Yeah. Thanks, so if you feel like you wanna be asked a question, let me know. Um, yeah, I, I also wanted to, well, there's a lot, I think, to say. Um, one thing that I had in, well, the whole process of translating a play, and specifically from, I think, Japan, which is always our fantasy of a, lost in translation land, right? A place that's so different in a way. Uh, and often it happens with theater specifically, um, that you have a sense of otherness, right? Um, how did you, how did that translate in the, in the rehearsal room, for example? Well, I mean, it, it, was, it came up right away. I remember rants, because, um, when I was talking to Rance about doing the part, he, he posed a very good question to me, but it's like how, like, I guess it was sort of how it would, I was thinking about its cultural translation, right? Mm -hmm. And so it came up really quickly um, with, with that conversation, which was really interesting, and I remember writing an email, a quick response, and then thinking like, wow, I didn't really answer his question. Um, because I think the, I think I was nervous about casting someone in this role and wanting to have, like, just give a sense of confidence or um, about what I was thinking. But then when I, so I sent something, and then when I thought back about, I was like, wow, I didn't really answer his question. Like, I didn't get below the surface of just sort of feeling like I needed to be like, it's okay it's gonna be okay, you know what I mean? And then, so, and then I thought, and it made me just think again, and I thought, oh, he's asking a really interesting question, which is like how, and he asked if there was gonna be Japanese people cast in it, and I said, you know, my sort of boilerplate answer was, well, I sort of believe this is about real cultural exchange, and so I, my instinct was not to cast a bunch of Asian actor, actors, but it was to see if, um, what would translate or what would work and what wouldn't work if it wasn't a lot of Asian actors on, on the stage. Um, but then when I, when I thought more deeply about it, I thought more about what things might connect to a Western audience and what things might, might be distinct. And what I found interesting about this piece is um, Tino's relationship with what I feel like is sort of Western psych psychological, like Freud and Jung, and I thought, well, that would be interesting because I actually don't know how how I don't know if in Japan the fact that Tonino is dealing with Freud and Jung is is what makes it in interesting for people, or whether that's like part of just 
current Japanese notions of psychology. So I, was, so I felt like, oh, well, that, that I think might translate in a Western audience a little bit, that kind of, it's about desire, and I felt like it was about a lot of those, those Western psych, sort of psychological traditions. So I, I mean, that, once I really started thinking about it, and then just, I mean, we just talked about otherness and the gaze, he's doing lots of things with like, uh, a man who wants to see, who can't see, um, people looking at other people in ways that seem unsanctioned. And I know like when we, when we got together and we're, we're staging the puppet show, I was feeling like, oh, I don't wanna put the person in the view of the people, of the audience. And then I thought, oh, maybe it'd be more interesting if we got to watch the other people watching um, that. And so, um, so that's kind of like, those were just small ways that we kind, I kind of, yeah. and, and how those ideas arrived. I mean, it's interesting, I also felt that not only is translation, and I really, well, I'm interested in theater, and I think the idea of translated theater is somehow a more difficult task, um, and more interesting in, in that it's, it's really impossible, it's always impossible. Um, but the idea of intercultural or transcultural um, work, I think the, the play itself also uh, rep represents a kind of haft, uh, I don't know if haft, but you see clear uh, input from both a Japanese you know, dramaturgy and idea of spirits and nature that's always, and, and the kind of, um, yeah, ambient, I'd say, um, dramaturgy or flow of the action. And on the other hand, it's true that there's a lot of Chekhov, <laughs> right? Um, from the Vanya-esque uh, destruction of the place and uh, this play within a play that's kind of... Um, so, and your last work was, uh, was Vanya? I was just thought... thought was uh, yeah, mm -hmm. well, yeah. Did that, did that resonate? Is that... Um, um, actually, it's, it's interesting. That makes a lot of sense, but I actually didn't, wasn't really thinking about Chekhov, actually. But, um, yeah, it kind of yeah. makes sense. I mean... You don't have to say yes, it's fine. <laughs> no, no, I mean, now that you brought it up, yeah. I mean, it's interesting. But I, I didn't really think about Chekhov. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that, that's kind of, I guess, my way to um, connect to your question. As actors also, there's a question of, am I playing a spirit or am I playing a person? No. Um, what, kind of, what kind of presence am I supposed to summon here? What kind of, um, did you, and I know this is a, you know, a little reading that we're doing, but is it something that, I don't know, anybody of the actors uh, felt that they're dealing with? The question of, am I, do I have a history? Am I a person here or am I a, a, a more um, metaphysical representation of personhood, let's say? I can tell you that I, um, talking about Chekhov, um, I was doing a reading of Uncle Vanya, which was put together by Mallory Catlett. But each person um, that we played, we were of an older age. And I was Sonia in Uncle Vanya, and still madly in love with Astrov. And it was just, it went along like that. But we also were looking back and reliving what we went through, um, the people that we all cared for and how our lives were decomposing. And it was interesting because lives do happen like that. Mm -hmm. And it was so interesting that Chekhov was right on to it. And he wrote, the, he wrote this in the 1800s. Oh, thanks. Um, maybe the one last question that I have before I'll uh, open it to the audience is the act of the na narrator, uh, or it's okay, don't be scared. <laughs> um, no, I was wondering about that because that it, it, in itself is also a bit like, is it 
is it a person? Is it the author? Is it uh, an actor? Is it a narrator? narrator? And the way that um, the text seems to play with these different roles um, and these different modes of engagement with the action um, was also intriguing and I thought reflected back on this unstable uh, presence of the actress as well. So it's a kind of open question about that, but, but um, how did that feel? How did that, how, you know, what were your thoughts about this uh, unstable position? Yeah, <laughs> unstable, yes. that's a really good word. Because the very first time I read this script was this afternoon. <laughs> And so a long time ago. <laughs> yeah, That's so um, it, 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 so it, it, it was a process of, of discovery, uh, actual happening in the moment, discovery of, oh, oh, this is happening. And um, so the same thing happened here, except that it's a little bit different because you're, you know, not alone in a little room with your little group. Because you know there are people watching and listening, and yet something else happened. There was another level of something else happening, uh, while um, as the I was thinking, I didn't think. I actually didn't think. I didn't have time to think, but I started to feel like, oh, I'm the narrator. Uh, I'm I'm the guide. Oh, now I'm kind of speaking for or expressing the inside feelings of a, pa a character, and now I'm here's the set, mm -hmm. and here's and and, and so it, it changed, and that and that was and I thought, oh my God, you know, if I knew all these lines, how much fun <laughs> could you have with that? So yeah, it felt like a character. It felt like the spirit of the house, it felt like the voice of the um, writer, whom I haven't met. And um, yeah, so it, it started to feel like that. Uh, I'm kind of curious about um, that kind of unstable uh, narration, but also when the author's voice is breaking through or when there's breakage in the character or language that doesn't seem to track with like the smartphone suddenly, mm -hmm. or in the rehearsal we were thinking, well, clearly they're all masturbating at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but I like the idea that to solve that problem, you would decide it's haunted, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, the, that the ghost of something is, kind of, or I don't feel as visitors to the space, the two of us did not feel particularly ghost-like, but mm -hmm. that right. the breakage or that the narration, the, the voice of the narrator, some of the kind of uh, overly rich description, the, the, the rationale for that would be, well, they're clearly 18th century ghosts or something that are beyond their time or beyond this time somehow. I like that. I'm just saying I like the idea that you would have broken, broken moments or slippery moments where you're trying to figure out why is the language drawing attention to itself as language and decide, oh, it's haunted. That's the reason. <laughs> I'm not sure if that helps. But. Right. No, but I think sure. it also, the question of haunted and the time that passes also has to do with the father's son, you know, coming into this other place to negotiate the time, in a way, mm -hmm. um, with this ever-flowing spring. Um, yes. I'll open it up. Do, do, is there questions on the audience? Uh, maybe a bit about the use of the music and how that came in. Of course, sorry. Um, well, I'll just say I, um, I actually tried for a while to find the actual instruments that are mentioned in the script and found a lot of difficulty and then eventually got a hold of Tonino and he's, the koku, um, which is the instrument that goes along with the puppet show, is extremely rare, and there was almost no one in the city that even played it. Um, so I asked the playwright, you know, what was the significance, and he said, "Well, it's just a local thing, you know, in the area." And he said, "You can do whatever you want." And so I was just thinking about the casting, and and um, uh, Robin, Kristen have a band called the Cushions, and I had just seen them, and I was just like, "Oh." and they would also be really good in the thing, and so maybe I'll just ask them to 
do it. And it was, it was really fun. So I don't know if you want to chime in, but I think the idea of translation was really interesting in that because once we decided we weren't going to try to match up the instrumentation, then it was like, well, how do you take this like very, like something that's very organic and natural to that sort of Japanese setting and just do something like sort of completely synthetic and like use a dr dr drum pad, you know, not even drums. And, and then it was just, it kind of was freeing, but I think you guys might be talk a little bit more about how you negotiated the sounds and things like that. Well, I think um, we considered lots of different options for, for instance, my instrument, which is the shamisen, which is um, like a stringed sort of a guitar-like, yeah, instrument. But um, just playing um, an acoustic instrument seemed wrong, especially I'm a white person. <laughs> so um, I thought maybe just to make it completely ridiculous. Um, and also, yes, we were approached as a band, sort of, as an option. And so in the band, Rob sings and plays guitar and I play the drums. So it was sort of like a, a version, which we don't sound anything like this, but um, so it, but it just made sense for our sake. But also, yes, um, I mean, I, I did, I did feel strange being a white <laughs> geisha. So yeah, um, I just wanted to make it completely clear that it was a strange um, endeavor, but. Um, I, I think we're using the tools that are available to us as musicians, like regularly, um, but also trying to create environment, direct, direct sampling, especially on the floor, just everything's live and kind of in that way is as inorganic or as synthetic as it might sound. It's also a very organic, physical experience to do it that way. And I think I think it would be, I could imagine developing it where everyone's in the loop, the whole ensemble sort of in this kind of wildly, um, you know, complicated mess. Mm -hmm. uh, but for what, it, for what it, you know, especially the, the crying baby at the end is my favorite moment. <laughs> um, I'll just say like the funny thing that happened, which is like suddenly I was like, oh, this was really working is that I think because Rob's doing so much of like, physical sounds that bodies make, and that's so much a part of what the play is about. And I, it just allowed me to kind of get over within this reading setting of having to have the actors kind of simulate those sounds. I think it's really tricky because there's so much sound information, and obviously that's a tremendously rich part of his work. I mean, you can just tell there's so many descriptions of sounds that I just, it was really nice because it didn't feel like Foley so much. I didn't want it to get there, but I loved how the sighing, the breathing, the squishy, you know, all the sort of bodily sounds, I thought were really, um, worked really well with all the references of the body and mm -hmm. sex and babies and um, drinking water and, you know, all of that. So I thought that was just like a kind of great happy accident in the, in the meshing of these two things. I totally agree. Yeah. It really worked well for me as well. Um, Alex, you had a question? Yes, you kind of asked her already. Um, I, I was going to ask about uh, sex in the play and the pleasure. I wanted to know what your experience was, was by translating it, right? From uh, Japanese experience of sex, I guess, if that such thing exists, <laughs> if it's quite broad, uh, but how it translates uh, to your body since you read it and experienced it. Um, I don't know. It was interesting. We did have that thought at the end when they're singing. Like, it just sort of came up after getting all the way through it. And I don't know that we kind of, like, could really convey it. But this idea that the three women in the bath might sort of be masturbating, the laughing is all about sort of this, like, great masturbation scene. It just sort of, it kind of occurred to us as by the, by the end. And I don't, actually don't know if that's what it's really about. But I think we weren't, we we kind of eased into that where we just started thinking, oh, 
all of this is about sex and bodies and, but we kind of, I mean, that's something we sort of discovered once we were in the room together and that would be one of the things that would be really fun to kind of really go for and like get into that aspect of it, I think, um, if we were to continue to do it. And the other thing I think that was interesting is just the, the way in which once you understand those things, the way in which um, the sort of city folk can kind of turn the tables on the other characters by understanding that they have these sort of perverse desires or, and they kind of know, and so they can kind of, like when he touches his face, he sort of is like checking him. So they can kind of use their difference and their physical difference to kind of undermine all this kind of um, normative behavior that's happening. And that was something that we sort of like, talked about certainly when we were rehearsing. And I think there's something about how the sexual aspect or, or um, those kinds of things get flipped and then become this like really nice like life force of the piece, which is something that I think that I just could really feel once we started talking and being in the room together. All right, um, I think there's, I, sh I should be saying something about uh, the archive, is that the, uh, there's a bar on 36, right? Is it 36th Street? Mm -hmm. um, called the Archive, and uh, we will um, have a drink there, uh, hopefully, if you're interested and uh, have uh, uh, the will. Uh, so please join us at the Archive for a post-show, post-talk reception. Thank you for coming.